Hello friends, this is Doug Batchelor. Uh, a lot has been happening in the news lately and I thought it warranted us having a prophecy news update again. In the context of the Bible, sometimes it's good for us to look at the headlines. Now, I don't want to be the Pope's personal biographer. I know a lot of these prophecy updates have had to do with what the Pope is doing, but this uh, Jesuit Pope has been busier in the last 18 months than virtually any Pope. So here's some things that have been happening just in the first part of the month of June that I think are very significant. You know, the Bible tells us before the end comes, before Jesus comes, that there's going to be a confederacy that will combine Catholics, Protestants, spiritualism. And we see these things happening in the news right now. For example, just on June 1st, Pope Francis spoke to almost 53,000 people that gathered in the Olympic Stadium in Rome and these were charismatics from Rome and other places. They came together and they prayed over the Pope speaking in tongues. Now, is it just me or does that remind you of something else that we saw in the news not too long ago where charismatics were praying over the Pope? That time, the Pope just sent a, a video message on his smartphone. This time, he actually came into the stadium and he knelt without the, the traditional uh, kneeling pillow he knelt there and asked them all to pray for him. You know, the Vatican News reports that this is the first time in history in which a pope visited an international charismatic renewal convocation. And so he came. Now the pope says at one time he had been uncomfortable with the charismatic movement, but evidently he's feeling a lot better about that. Uh, keep in mind the charismatics, it's talking about Protestant Christians and Catholic Christians that are united by their common worship of this glossolalia, the speaking in tongues, the ecstatic utterance that they call a heavenly prayer language. That was virtually unknown and unpracticed by Christians for the last 1900 years. The Bible tells us that there's going to be a unity of Protestants, spiritualism, Catholicism, and I think the spiritualism in part has to do with this Babylonian babbling that's taking over a lot of the Christian worship services. So that's one thing that happened. Now present at that meeting, interestingly enough, was a contingent of 15 members, a delegation of uh, religious leaders from America, and among them was Pastor Joel Osteen, who was in that group of 50,000 charismatics that were there praying for the Pope. For those who may not know, Joel Osteen is the well-known pastor of the large Lakeside Church in Houston, Texas, with thousands of members. The assembly in the auditorium took place June 1, but then on June 5, this delegation of 15 members representing religious leaders and political leaders from the United States met at the Vatican with the Pope in a private audience. Following the private meeting with the Pope and the others in the Vatican, Joel Osteen said, it was a great honor to represent the pastors of America in the meeting with the pontiff. I'm not sure that I feel comfortable with Joel Osteen saying that he represents all these pastors from America because I think people have forgotten what the vast gulf of differences are between what the Roman Catholics believe and what Protestants are supposed to believe. You know, it used to be that America was really um, a haven for Protestant values that this country was the bulwark of safety for those Christian ideals. But little by little, that is all eroding, friends. It says in Revelation chapter 13 that the second beast in Revelation, which we believe is the United States, the one that rises up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon, is eventually going to make an image to the first beast that receives the deadly wound that is healed, and all the world wonders we're watching right now as all the world wonders. And you can see, even in the architecture of the United States, how little by little, look at the Washington Monument and look at the obelisk that is in the Vatican. Look at the Capitol building and look at the Vatican Dome. You can just even visually sense where the United States is gradually making an image to the beast. And now you can see that uh, we're putting aside our values that once separated these two great continents philosophically and everything is amalgamating now, preparing for this final consolidation. And as if our Jesuit Pope hasn't been busy enough, just a few days later, he had a special meeting at the Vatican where President Shimon Peres of Israel and President Mohammed Abbas of Palestine came to meet at the Vatican. Not only they came, but they also came with Bartholomew, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church. 
Boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't really a picture, all coming to the Vatican to talk about peace. Reminds us of that verse in the Bible that says, when they say peace, peace, then sudden destruction will come. The Pope has now placed himself in a position in just one year where he has become sort of an international peace broker. Very interesting. In fact, let me read to you one newspaper reporter's take on this. The three leaders, joined by the Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew I, heard Christian, Jewish, and Islamic prayers from cardinals, rabbis, and Muslim imams. The two-hour meeting in the Vatican Gardens included prayers from the Old and New Testament and the Koran that were read and chanted in Hebrew, Arabic, English, and Italian. Now that's the first time that prayers were officially offered reading from the Koran in Arabic uh, to Allah in the Vatican. Is it just me or are things happening? In fact, a lot of people have always wondered, how will we get this confederacy where there's this one world religion compelling everybody to worship a certain way in the last days? How do you get one billion Muslims to be able to work in harmony with Jews and Protestants and Christians? Well, you have your answer now. The Pope knows how to bring them all together. And that's just what prophecy told us is gonna happen. I know I've shared this with people several times before, but that quote from Great Controversy, page 588, keeps coming back to mind. Let me read it to you again. Through the two great errors of the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They'll reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this great country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. You know, I see that confederacy taking place between Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism. You know, one of the big movies, it's still in the theaters right now, is called Is Heaven for Real? Based upon this boy that survives a near-death uh, appendix operation and comes out of that saying that he's seen people that are dead and he's communed with them. Talking to the dead, that's what this spiritualism is all about. And here you have Catholics and Protestants all embracing this concept. I mean, what else does it mean when the Pope has the power to... Uh, declare to former popes to be saints that can be prayed to. Isn't that about praying to the dead? And we saw that just happen last month. And so, well, just there's an ongoing march that seems to be taking place. You know, this reminds me of a couple of books that came out a few years ago. Here's one called A House United by Keith A. Fournier. Talks about evangelicals and Catholics together, a winning alliance for the 21st century. And in the book, the whole book really leads up to a preamble of an interesting document that was prepared for the third millennium called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. This lengthy document was signed by hundreds of religious leaders. Many people have forgotten about it. it took place in 1994, but they mapped out their plans for Catholics and Charismatics and Evangelicals to work together to build a confederacy for changing society. And you know what? They're marching through this plan just as they foretold. You can, by the way, find this anywhere online. One more time, it's called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, The Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. Among the things they talk about is we must not be a proselytizing or evangelizing believers from other faiths. Catholics in particular do not want Protestants trying to evangelize their believers. And so those who have signed on to this agree with that. They also believe that we should be using civil powers and government to enforce certain moral values. There's probably areas where I would agree with that, but that will be used eventually in saying that the legal powers are going to be used to tell us when and where and what day to worship. In addition, another book that came out during the uh, same time is a book by the late Chuck Colson. I met him, good man. Evangelicals and Catholics Towards a Common Mission Together and in this, they talk about one of the things that is uniting the evangelicals and the Catholics is our common worship styles. Let me read you a little quote here or two. More generally, the spread of the charismatic movement through songs, prayers, and worship styles going well beyond officially charismatic circles 
has done a great deal to reduce the barriers between Catholics and evangelicals. Here's another quote from that book, page 172. Billy Graham's cooperative evangelism, in which all the churches in an area are invited to share, is one such. Charismatic gatherings where the distinction between Protestant and Catholic vanishes. Now that's a scary thought right by itself. In a Christ-centered unity of worship, fellowship, and joy are further examples of this. So you can see where this is heading, friends. Little by little, the barriers, the theological distinctions that make us unique in our beliefs are being eroded and dissolved. They're gradually evaporating. And this Pope is doing a masterful job of breaking those things down. You know, I, let me just wrap some of these thoughts up. I could go on and on. But it reminds me of a couple of prophecies in the Bible. You can start out, for example, by going to Daniel chapter 11. Keep in mind, in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about Michael standing up. This is the end of the world. There being a great time of trouble. There being a resurrection just before that end time scenario. It talks about the beast power, the one who has no regard for the desire of women in Daniel chapter 11. And it's just interesting. I don't claim to understand it all, but in Daniel 11, the last few verses, it talks about the glorious land, the promised land. And it says that um, he'll plant his tabernacle in the glorious mountain. And then it lists a number of Middle Eastern countries. Oh, it probably doesn't mean anything, friends, so don't you get worried. You can also read in Revelation chapter 16, speaking about the last plague before the battle of Armageddon. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs that go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief, Jesus said. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And they gather them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. You know, friends, I just see a consolidation, a coming together of world events that are paving the way for things that are going to be happening soon. And all of this recent notoriety of the Pope is happening against the backdrop of an upcoming synod that's happening in October. Let me read it to you from the Catholic website. Pope Francis has called for an extraordinary general assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the theme of challenges of the family in the context of evangelization. The Vatican has announced this synod, which will take place at the Vatican October 5 through 19, 2014, is a means through which the Holy Father wishes to continue the reflection and the journey of the whole church with the participation of leaders from every corner of the world. This is going to be a time where they're going to come together and talk about the dynamics of the family. No doubt they're going to talk about the problems with homosexuality and how that relates to the definition of marriage and they'll be talking about abortion and I expect they're going to talk about the importance of Sunday worship to bring the family together. So just be watching friends because I think a lot of things are playing out right now. So as we see the confluence of all these events, even the secular writers in the world are, are sitting back marveling at how busy this Pope has been placing himself right at the center stage in the events of religion and politics. And this is exactly what prophecy said is going to happen. He has to be in a position where he's going to create a confederacy of world powers, that the world is going to look to him for answers. You know, right now, if there was some catastrophe in the world, if there was a financial meltdown, if there was some tremendous natural disaster, who do you think in the world has positioned himself to be the one that everyone is going to look to for answers? And they'll give him a great deal of credibility, especially if people are afraid because of some catastrophe or financial disaster, and he, his emphasis on prayer is wonderful. But this is exactly what I've always expected uh, the world would look like just before the end, friends. That's why it's so important. If you don't understand why this is important, you need to get a hold of that video that we recently produced called Revelation, The Bride, the Beast, and Babylon. You can download it from iTunes. You can order it from Amazon. It's at all major outlets. And you can go to the website. It's called revelationmystery.com. We need to be praying. And if there's something in your life where you're not ready, you need to get right with God now.